peat. It's a smell of place, home, and tradition. It provides an emotional connection and flavor to one of whiskey's most iconic styles and is deeply embedded in the Scottish culture. It is truly nature's greatest flavor brick. But the first distillers didn't use peat to make a smoky whiskey. They used it because they had no other alternative. Peat is an organic fuel that you'll find in bogs that consists of partly decomposed plant material. For thousands of years, plants, moss, vegetation have grown and died in wet conditions without sufficient oxygen for the deposits to fully break down, layering the peat banks of today. They lock in massive amounts of carbon, and when they are damaged, carbon is lost directly into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases and into rivers and streams. Whiskey distilleries no longer burn peat as the primary fuel to dry their grain, but they do burn peat to infuse the grain with smoke to impart its distinct flavors. But as climate change intensifies, and with the lack of alternatives for peat, the importance of maintaining healthy peatlands is growing, and with the Scotch Whiskey Industry Initiative of being net zero emissions by 2040, the evolution of peat extraction needs to be addressed. Peat has been such an integral part of the Hebrides and, and of Isla life. So people have used it as a fuel for thousands of years. People still cut it as a fuel. An awful lot of the land mass on Isla is peat. It is a fossil fuel at the end of the day. It only regenerates at a millimetre a year. If you cut down with a fowl down into the peats, that metre of peat, you know, it's thousands and thousands of years. And, we have to be responsible and we have to be careful because it is an integral part of what we do. The flavour of Ardbeg, unpeated. We tried it before, Blasda. We did a, a version of Ardbeg unpeated. And it was a really interesting discussion about it, but really what we do, we need peat. And you can't artificially recreate, well you maybe could, but it would be incredibly difficult because when we talk about phenol in a bottle, that's just a phenol we're measuring. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of different smoky compounds which make your flavour and give you the taste. And we are careful in what we extract because it will regenerate and it will regenerate slowly. When you look at what's extracted around Scotland in terms of peat, 97 odd percent is, is still going into compost. 2% is still used for domestic heating and only about 1% of all extracted is used for Scotch whisky. So it's small in what we're using, but we have to be careful and we're responsible. We're part of a, a huge industry that works very hard around sustainability and we're part of a huge company that has very stringent, strict sustainability, you know, carbon neutral targets. So we're all very aware of what it is and it's just about working together with the Scotch whisky industry to work out how we best do it responsibly and how that we put back so when we're finished with using peat banks they're restored and are brought back to be um, wildlife havens and things like that so there's lots of work still to be done but it's something that we're all very very aware of because it's integral to what we do. My first question is is you know looking at just the the peat season in general, you know, when do you start? Obviously we're here at the end of August, yeah. early September, but when do you really truly start and what does the season look like for peat? The peat cutting season is determined really by the, the time of year. So we normally start about April time, we get everything cut during April. And you're relying on May, June really for good drying weather, so a nice wind, some sunshine. And really that's the whole point of it. If you leave it too much longer, I mean, where are we now? It's end of August, nearly September. So we're quite late actually to be finalizing and clearing the bank of peat. And that's mainly because we've had such a, a poor spring and summer really. We haven't had the drying weather. The major difference is, is quantities really for Cahoman. Um, obviously we're peating to 22 parts per million and we're using hand cut peat. So we're using less peat. We're only having a fire every five days or so in accordance with our, our malting program. And, and that fire's only gonna be on for 15 hours. So you can say really, this, these few peats here, just behind you there, is gonna be roughly what we're gonna use on that fire, along with some dross or peat calf as they call it, just the broken pieces of peat. 
to dampen down the fire and cool down the fire. And you know, we can actually keep a fire going for that length of time with a, a small number of peat, really. We were down here looking at the length and the width of the cuts, you know, and you were telling me, you know, the, that left side, you know, that that's year one, yeah. year two, year three, year four. Now that's I think right. it's like year five that, yeah. that we're on. Yeah. And then the length of it, can you talk to me about the length and the width, the dimensions? Like, Well, uh, traditionally um, we can cut, I think it's about 50 or 60 centimeters, yeah. but I'm cutting about five peats wide maybe six sometimes, and depending on how straight your bank is. Yeah, yeah. And it's looking pretty good from here, <laughs> <laughs> if I say so myself. Yeah, yeah. But really the reason for that is, if you make it wider, the peat's cut and it's laid on the bank, and then your, your person with a fork will take it out. Traditionally, you pick the peat up a couple of steps, lay it down, and then work away at that. And then, so you're coming this way as well, so you've got to get the dimensions right, width out this way and width down that way. The vast majority of Isla is, is covered in peat moss, uh, so you will be able to extract peat from wherever you look, you know, apart from the pasture and, and fields mm -hmm. and rocky ground. Talking about Kilcombe and they, again, 20, you know, parts per million, 20, you know, 2022, somewhere in that realm. Obviously, we know that other distilleries on Isla, you know, are a lot higher, you know, and maybe a little bit less. Uh, you guys produce roughly 550,000 liters ish, yeah, ish yeah. right? Looking from the start of this to the end of this bank, I mean, for does that that whole length and then the width you talked about, the 60 centimeters, mm -hmm. does that give you a year's worth? Ish, yeah. yeah. Again, it's a big ish because yeah. uh, what I mean. Let's take it back to cutting peat for fuel. I've got a, a kind of storage on the bank there that is part of last year's cutting. And traditionally, peat cutters would always keep some in reserve in case if you were relying on it for fuel in the house, you need that fuel source. And if you were to be injured or if unable to peat cut for some reason or other, you always had a, a source there. A bit like cutting uh, wood and logs, and you always got a, a source drying out. Uh, ready for worst case, case scenario really so that's what I've got here so what you see on the bank and roughly the full length of that yeah I mean is, is roughly about a year Years, yeah. but of course you know experimentation sometimes we do unpeated sometimes we'll do longer peatings so you know there's so many variables but on average this will do a year. I was thinking that you had I mean you clear out a whole you know, area looking to the left and the right for a year's worth, right? You know, to keep peat going and looking at it, even just at 550,000 liters, just this narrow and then this, yeah. this length is really what you need. It's eye-opening for me. You have to be careful about what we're actually malting because that peat fire is actually underneath three to four tons of malt barley which is sm very small compared with the other guys that are malting here, like Beaumont and Laphroaig. They've got multiple floors, we've got one floor. Yeah. So one fire every five days under a small kiln, yeah. you know, or a, a quantity of malt is, is a small fire, you know, yeah. and it's not a lot of peat to burn. Yeah. Really. This is the actual layer that the distillery wants, but traditionally to heat the homes, you had to get down to this layer first. Yeah, but you know, they would never put this to waste. They would always burn it. So they would always assess how they wanted their fire. If they wanted a quick hot fire, they, they would mix it up. I yeah. mean, people burning peat know, you used to know what kind of heat they would get out of each. But if you put this much, of it, much effort into extracting this by hand, you're going to burn it, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> ultimately. So, so really, if I was cutting this bank next year, I'd, I'd be probably taking turf off to about this level. Yeah. So we cut vertically first, using the, the big turf and spade there, and we'd cut this width. Yeah. And then I would take a, another spade and cut inwards, and then it would become free. And then I would just lift that mm -hmm. and place it on the, on the ground there. You see, I mean, these, these are individual turfs. Uh, laid out so and you can see I've just left the channel yep. ready for the turf for next year and that'll just fall into here and that exposes the peat to be cut you can almost see where the peat spade yep. the peat the knife, peat knife has been so that would be your first peat yep. 
and then you would work back on a first peak, keep going, keep going, yeah. and it's up to you how far you go. But then ultimately you're moving on to the second peak, which is again about that. Yep. And you can see it's getting darker and darker, right. less fibrous. Right. And then you get to the third peak, which is actually pure black. Yeah. The whiskey industry, this this stuff is still valuable, even the stuff on the ground. And the peat calf and the peat, the peat dross is just small bits, crumbly bits that hold a bit of moisture, but yeah. we can damp the fire down quickly using this. So it's a, when we're having the fire, you'll see the guys put a mixture of peats on. Yeah. And because you're just trying to keep that fire nice and cool, nice and smoky. Yeah. But when you think about it, I mean, they do say it's like a thousand years for each millimetre to, to, to produce this stuff. Yeah. It's quite a significant environmental issue when you do when you think about it because that that's taken well how deep is that it's over a meter so you know that's that's some history there yeah you cut it yeah. you lay it on the bank here uh you know talk to me about the drying and mm. the importance of that and how you guys go about once they're laid out when you're relying on a bit of nice weather what we call it is it forming a skin so skinning up so mm -hmm. after a week or so this will have a skin on it and it'll become waterproof. And then the next stage, once that, once you're happy with that, you'll turn it, yep. and then you do the same on this side. So that's the second part. And then the third part for the final uh, part piece of drying mm -hmm. is either, there's two ways of doing it, or well, there's many ways, but um, you can actually put them up in what we call windows. Mm -hmm. And that allows the, the wind to go through in all directions and to actually finally dry the peat out. Yeah. But then there's the other way we can just form a stook. Yep. It's a bit more time consuming, but that's the more, the more traditional way of doing it. And once you're happy, I mean, you could, you could grab a, it's, it's lighter, not quite, but it's a bottom piece. So it's yeah. going to be more dense yeah. and heavier. Yeah. Um, over here, we've got a top peak. Oh yeah. So the difference is quite, marked really mm -hmm. i mean this is dark and black yeah. you see a little bit of uh, sand and gravel yeah. uh, from the bottom of the the peat bank but this will be the layer just underneath the turf yeah. and, and actually this is what we really want in the kiln because this actually will be smokier nice white smoke and that's what we want yeah. this uh, would be used traditionally in the house. If I was burning this for fuel in the house, this is what I'd be after, because this would burn, give me that really intense heat. And that's not what we want in the kiln. All we want is the flavor yeah. from the smoke, you know, getting absorbed on the outside of the barley kernel, really, after it's been malted. But of course, we're supplying peat and we're not gonna separate the two. Yeah. We'll, we'll supply it all together, because ultimately that does generate smoke as well. Yeah. Now I truly understand why you guys hate midges. <laughs> they suck. I gotta say they, they are they're worse than ever this year. I've not experienced them this bad, but it really is weather dependent. If they have the right conditions, they're out. Yeah, I was gonna say you probably have a nice wind and you'd be all right, but there is literally no wind. Sun's out. I mean, it was a hot day today. And when you're cutting in the spring, of course, it's too early for them in the season. So, and it's just the females that bite. Ah, oh. typical. Tip it. <laughs> that won't make the episode, Derek. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, but that is actually a fact. But it is. No, I'm. I'm with you. I'm with you. The Scotch whiskey industry is beginning to reconsider its extraction of peat and collaborating with conservation NGOs, and whiskey distilleries are initiating restoration projects, sourcing their peat in a manner which alleviates some of the harmful consequences. Could you talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on peat and the topic around sustainability of peat? Yeah, it, it's a big topic, and I think we are very aware that yeah, what we're kind of depleting a, a resource by making peat whiskey. So we are very aware of how much we actually use uh, per year. You know, it, it's 
less than 200 tonnes to produce what we do. So you could look at that and say that's not very much in what's extracted around about. But I think the great thing about Scotch whisky is that we know how important it is to the flavour, the identity of particularly Isla whiskies. Um, so again, Octomo, the most heavily peated whisky the world we're drinking now, you know, that peat flavour that's on the palate, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's evocative of the place. And for thousands of years, you know, people in Isla have been digging peat to heat their homes and to peat barley for making whisky. If we want to continue doing that, then we've got to have some real action on actually looking after those and, and preserving them and making sure that, uh, again, the improvements that were made across the country decades, centuries ago about draining these peat bogs, that we do more, and the Scotch whisky industry supports that in actually regenerating these peatlands because, again, the carbon that they are absorbing and storing is, is crucial, you know? So everything we do at Brickladdy, that sustainability agenda we have is, is, you know, it's looking at every single aspect, and peat is a, is a huge one. Today, you know, I probably don't have the answer on, on what that is, but it's something that you cannot escape, we're really aware of, and it's, it's a difficult question, you know, because again, it's, it's such a conflict, but I think it's something that we definitely won't shy away from. We definitely kind of will, will, will kind of look through. We need as an industry to be responsible and to promote what we're doing in a way that people understand a bit more uh, than they do now, because I think peat extraction, whatever it's for, uh, is not felt as a, as a very responsible thing to do. But I think that uh, the amount we use, and an industry, we, we don't use uh, very much. Uh, the extraction, I believe, is of all peat. 1% is for um, whiskey. So it's a very small part, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't make sure that we do it in a responsible way. It's not going away, that topic, and, and it will continue. So we just need to be promoting it in a way that people understand a bit more. I think it's educational. We need to educate people. Well, for the industry on Isla, it's a massive part of what we do. So we need to protect that and educate people in a way that they understand that we're not ruining the landscape. The key thing is it's important to Isla, yes. people who live and work here, yeah. and most of them in the Scotch whisky industry. Our whiskies have, have uh, drawn popularity and fame around the world because of the peat that the peat that's used in the malting stage. And we just need to make sure that um, people understand that we're, we're very conscious of, of our responsibilities.